Let us pray. Loving God, as we meet you in your word, what we see not show us, what we know not teach us, and what we are not make us. For Christ's sake. Amen. The words on your motto card and from Psalm 126 and verse 3. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Well, it's good to be here. Thank you so much for your welcome. But I must apologize for my somewhat somber clothing that I'm wearing today. I was hoping to wear various gifts that I've been given during my presidential year. But when I suggested to your superintendent minister that I might wear my Ghanaian robes, he said, remember the Nigerians. So then I said, well, in addition to my my Ghanaian robes, perhaps I could wear my Nigerian stole. To which he said, remember the South Africans. To which I said, well, in addition to my Ghanaian robes and my Nigerian stole, perhaps I could remember my, I could wear my South African shirt. To which he replied, remember the Ethiopians. <laughs> so then I said, what would it be if I wore both my Ghanaian robes and my Nigerian stole and my South African shirt and my Ethiopian hat? To which he replied, remember that you will look like a Christmas tree and we've just got rid of one of those. So I come as I am. (laughs) But actually, you know, remembering is important. It's the first word on the strap line of our motto card. As during this year, 2012, we get ready here to celebrate the centenary of this place. Remembering is important. And it's only when we go upstairs and quite forget what we went up for, or we find ourselves driving along a road and we don't either know how we got there or why we were there in the first place, or more seriously, when we or another suffers memory loss and live with the frustration and the deep sadness of that, that we realize how important remembering is. But you know you can get spiritual memory loss too. That's what happened here in Psalm 126. It's the year 538 BC. Cyrus has conquered Babylon, the oppressor of God's people. He issues a decree ending the captivity of the Jews and ordering the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. It's amazing. They could return home. No liberation fighters on the streets. No shots fired in anger. No rigged or worthless elections. They were free. It was like a dream. But it was true. No wonder we're told that they laughed. They probably cried too. But you know, it was only when the nations around about them said, the Lord has done great things for them, that the penny dropped and they remembered. And they said, the Lord has done great things for us. It's not chance or luck or coincidence. This is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. Well, I wonder what you are in danger of forgetting. Perhaps in this special year, this special building, erected not so much to bring glory to Methodism as to bring glory to God. And at the heart of this great city, to make known in word and deed the goodness and the greatness of God and God's love for all people. Sometimes we forget those million Methodists who gave a guinea each to build this place. 
My father used to tell me how generous his father had been in this regard. So it was a little embarrassing when I couldn't find his name on the historic roll at all. So I think kindly of someone who I never met and can only presume that he gave anonymously. But the giving of so many should be a reminder still to us of our connection with the worldwide Methodist Church and of its people, of how much we need each other to fulfill God's mission. Or perhaps we've forgotten the privilege of being a part of this church family today. A large, ethnically diverse congregation. Worship that is both varied and vibrant. A staff team that most churches would give their eye teeth for. And if you doubt any of that, perhaps accompanying me as president during these next few months would not only open your eyes, but bring you to your knees in thankfulness for this place and this people. So I hope that during this year there will be many occasions when you will remember and have reason to say, the Lord has done great things for us. For us. And for you. I do hope so. Yes, even in this past year. A prayer answered. A relationship restored. A new step of faith taken. taken. Healing and wholeness a part of your experience. An addiction overcome. A conflict past. And at every turn of the journey, the grace and the faithfulness of God. But you know, you might have forgotten. For it's terribly easy, easy in the hustle and bustle of our lives to do so. Or worse still, to take these things for granted, rather than make them a cause for thankfulness. So I was glad to meet a lady recently, who during these past 12 months has kept a journal and a jar. In her journal, she's jotted down most nights those ways in which she's seen God's hand at work in her life, or in the life of those around her, or in the church, or in the world. And next morning, she's put 10 pence, or sometimes a little more, for charity in a jar for each entry that she's written. And she was amazed by how much money she'd raised at the end of the year. It was for her a simple way of remembering to remember. The Lord has done great things for us. And says the psalmist, we are filled with joy. So remembering leads to rejoicing. That second word the word on our strap line, on the motto card. So I pray for you that rejoicing will be a characteristic of your church's life and of your Christian life in these coming days. I hope the rafters will ring and your hearts will sing often in praise and thankfulness to God. But what if that rejoicing goes wrong? What if it becomes selfish, with no thought for the sadness and the sorrows of others? What if it becomes sentimental and simply amounts to having a good time? What if it becomes subjective? entirely dependent on whether things are going well for us? What if it becomes stagnant and stale, a going through the motions? 
Well, you see, that was the situation described in Psalm 126 too. Did you notice how in that psalm the mood changes? You see, their remembering and their rejoicing was for the past. But it had become stuck there. Would there be any further cause for remembering and rejoicing? Or were there glory days behind them? God forbid, says the psalmist. So now he prays for the renewing of the people of God. Renewing. That third word on our motto card. It is the story of an Australian outback family who came to Sydney for the very first time. They'd never been to a large city at all. The father and his son left the mother in the car whilst they went to the foyer to check in. And they couldn't get over these two doors that kept opening and shutting. People would walk in. And then a few minutes later, a different group of people would walk out when buttons were pressed. It was as though by magic. They'd never seen anything quite like it. And as they watched, they saw an elderly lady, frail and dowdy, walk into what was, of course, the lift. A few seconds later, a stunning blonde appeared as the doors opened. The father turned to his son and said, Quick, go and get mum and see if it'll work for her as well. <laughs> well, that's one kind of renewing, I guess. But I don't think it's the kind that the psalmist has in mind here. Rather, this renewing is more akin to the renewing of our car tax or our TV license, or our library book, when we say, yes, what happened in the past, I want to see continue into the future. In the context of this covenant service, it's asking in the words of the four readings that we often hear of this service, that God would renew our wills that we might serve him, that God would renew our hearts that we might love him, that God would renew our minds that we might think for him, that God might renew our whole being that we might be rooted and grounded in him. And to what end? Well, notice how the psalmist prays. Turn again our fortunes, Lord as streams return to the dry south. He has in mind the dry gully, known as the Negev or the Negev, in the southernmost part of Judah. It extended down towards the Sinai Peninsula. In summer, just a few drops of rain would fall. But in winter, the streams of water would flow, bringing life to all around. And so the psalmist prays, Lord, now, today, let the rains come. Let the water flow. We've seen a trickle of your grace and mercy in the past, and we are thankful and we are filled with joy, but let it become a torrent. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Let our tears be a longing to see your kingdom come. Quench the thirst of all who are looking for you. Saturate us by your Spirit. Soak us in your grace that we might be a part of it all. That in this year and in every year, our remembering and our rejoicing may be continually renewed. And so we renew our covenant today. We say yes to God's yes to us. 
Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. But in faith we believe that we ain't seen nothing yet. Lord, let it be so. And in this and in every place, receive all the praise and the glory in Christ Jesus, now and always. Amen.